what if I told you that allowing yourself to be a dumbass would make you a better safety leader? That's what we're going to talk about today. I think somewhere I have slides. Oh, there we go. Um, <laughs> first, I want to talk about Todd's story that he told on Tuesday. I can give a different perspective on that because that night, many of you know that I'm Todd's neighbor, and that night I was walking past Todd's house, walking my dog. I walk my dog every night before I go to bed, and those of you who sleep with dogs know that that is a very good safety practice. So I <laughs> was walking Phoebe, my dog, and I crossed the bridge, and I looked over to Todd's house, and I saw a guy carrying these dark bags to the corner. And I thought, is that John Paul? John Paul is Todd's uh, tenant who lives in his casita, which is New Mexican speak for guest house. And it was after 11 o'clock at night, which is the middle of the night in Santa Fe, it was very dark. I was looking over. I wasn't wearing my glasses. I never wear my glasses because I'm vain. And I thought, huh, I could call out and say, hey, John Paul. But then I hesitated and thought, well, if that's not John Paul, I am a single woman in the middle of the night with a not at all vicious dog. And the two Brents, uh, if you're here, can attest to the fact that my dog is not at all vicious. So I'd have to deal with someone attacking me, and then I'd have to figure out where my dog ran off to. So I thought again, and I started walking, and we sort of walked into an area that, that, wasn't, that was pretty dark. And then I looked back, and I just thought, that guy is just really suspicious. Maybe I should call the cops. And then I thought, but what if it is John Paul? What if I'm wrong? And that would be <laughs> a big problem because, again, in New Mexican speak, I am a Hispanic woman. John Paul is a Native American man. And most of the policemen in Santa Fe are Anglo, which is New Mexican speak for white. And I do know the owner of the New Mexican, which is our newspaper, and she would print <laughs> Hispanic uh, community leader SWATs Native American professor. I could see that happening. So I thought, all right, I, I'm definitely not going to do that. So. You know, Phoebe and I just slink off into the night, and then the next day, I hear about the burglar situation and what happened to Todd, and it's that consequence that really made me worry about how I thought uh, about my decisions and really made me worry about the problem of being wrong and how my being afraid of being wrong kept me from doing anything at all. Well, I mean, you heard the story on Tuesday, and it's, it's fine. Uh, Todd didn't really lose anything that he was particularly interested in. The guy wasn't particularly nefarious or, or violent. So in many ways, a lot of my assessments weren't very good. But being wrong isn't just, you know, uh, this idea that, you know, all human beings are fa fallible and we all make mistakes. It's not just a condition. It's actually an ongoing practice. So if being wrong is an ongoing practice, how are we going to deal with it? Um, <laughs> I'm going to take a little moment here for a pre-job brief. I probably ate some really dodgy Chinese food last night. I am not feeling good. Um, my new um, best friend from Tesla, Jen, gave me permission to use some salty language, so I might. My old best friend, um, Jessica, might have to edit some stuff because I'm, I'm feeling a little bit 
salty uh, today. Um, and we're going to just delve into some stuff that I hope makes you a little uncomfortable because that's the point. We, we do need to get uncomfortable to, to deal with the fact that we're wrong. Now, I, uh, <laughs> I chose Homer Simpson as uh, sort of our mascot for today for a few reasons. One, he worked in the nuclear industry and Hop arguably was born out of the nuclear industry. Uh, two, uh, dough, which I think is an important <laughs> an important way for us to think about when we're wrong. And three, he and I have the exact same birthday. <laughs> I wasn't born in the 50s. I was born in the 60s, but we were both born on May 12th. And that means, if you believe in astrology, that we have the exact same Myers-Briggs profile. And that is an inside joke for the two Nicks. So you can ask them on the break what that means. Um, <laughs> so let's get into it. We are uh, going to use a Slido poll. Um, actually, Tanya taught me that just s randomly scanning uh, Slido polls can be, uh, what's the word that you used? Um, uh, a sketch, totally sketch, but this one is legit. I even have my Harvard logo on there and using my Harvard account so that you feel confident doing it. And you should have, in a second, actually I have to turn this on, a question pop, pop up. And so what's there is a syllogism, and I want you to read that and not tell me if it's true or not true, but tell me if you think it's logical or illogical. Does it feel logical or illogical to you? I'm seeing some results, and we'll share them in a bit. All right. I think we've slowed down. So let's share the results here. We have most of you who think it's logical and a few of you who think it's illogical. Now, raise your hand if you said that it was illogical. OK. Uh, keep your hand up if you said it was illogical because you actually know this is a false syllogism from Aristotelian logic. Uh, of the undistributed middle. <laughs> ha! Only Brian, of course. <laughs> Everybody else uh, who raised your hand, did you raise your hand because you probably figured that I was giving you a trick question and that you knew it was going to probably be illogical? Or it, did, you, did you choose that it was illogical because you wanted to get the right answer, even though you didn't have the right answer. Um, the, the thing that's sort of interesting about that, here's, here's what helps everybody understand this false syllogism. And that is a mouse with six legs. And that is what happens when you Google mutant rodent insect, and it's a real picture from an Israeli study on the effects of asbestos. Um, you can thank me for your nightmares later. Uh, so all insects need oxygen, mice need oxygen, therefore mice are insects. Same syllogistic pattern, and here you see how it's incorrect. So <laughs> The fact is that half of psychological experiments with significant statistical results are not reproducible. Now, you might think, well, it's psychology. It's kind of a soft science, isn't it? Um, but two-thirds of medical studies are ultimately refuted. So anybody have an idea of why you think that is? Is it just that science sucks? 
Or why do we have this pro why do we why do you think we have this problem? Brian? This is fun. <laughs> I I think it's because things are more complicated than we than we know at first and we do our best, but then as time goes on, we learn new things and as we add to the body of knowledge, we shift and adjust. I, I will go with that 100%. Because, I mean, the whole purpose why, why scientists pr um, publish in journals is to share their results and to have other people try and replicate their results. Because what we ultimately try to do in science is that we, we're, we're trying to disprove the null hypothesis. Who knows what the null hypothesis is? <laughs> oh, well, great. Now I'm not going to explain it well. <laughs> um, basically, it's the opposite of, of what most people think the hypothesis is, like what you're trying to prove. You're actually trying to disprove what you think might happen. Yes, exactly. So the null hypothesis is basically that the relationship that you are hypothesizing doesn't exist. So the best that you can do is disprove that you are entirely wrong. So we have a fallacy of being right. The real place where we live is in the gray area of being wrong. A show of hands, who has a culture in your organization where it's more important to be right than it is to, be, um, to learn? Where, yeah, okay, so there's a few. This is, this is the point where people raise their hands like this, right? But uh, most of, many of the organizations that I've worked in, uh, you know, always worked in sort of scientific and engineering organizations. This is very much the case. And we get brought into this situation because our power dynamics at school um, and how we get hired, how we are rewarded, is all around the importance of being right. But in fact, what we're doing is living in the world of being wrong. So, you know, I, I, uh, let's see how that feels. And I will ask you this question. In one word, describe how you feel when you're a dumbass. All right, let's go ahead and share those results as they come in. And I use the word dumbass actually pretty, I mean, I'm kind of enjoying saying it in public, um, but I'm using it pretty deliberately. Todd uses that term dumb <laughs> uh, with a lot of sauciness behind it. Um, uh, Jeff Lith and the Brents use dumb in their model. Uh, there's a lot laden in that judgment of dumb. There's the embarrassment. There's the shame. Um, are you guys able to share the results? So that you all can see what you have written. Here's our word cloud. So in that, we have to deal with the emotional component of being wrong in order to fully embrace that we're wrong and improve based on our misconceptions or the process of learning. There's no model of learning or creativity where at some point you are not confused, where at some point you're, you're not frustrated, where there isn't some of these feelings of being humbled um, and feeling stupid uh, in all of this. Uh, so let me go to the next slide here, I think. And this brings us to something that Rob brought up yesterday, that Andrea brought up yesterday, that it's a big part of kind of the hop canon, which is all about blame. And blame is an ego defense. Um, what is ego? Who has a good definition for ego? 
I'm walking to this side of the room. You guys look so smart. Ego? Ego, anyone? Ego. Uh, I said ego is all about uh, referring to myself. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So your ego is basically your constructed self, and, and that's how you relate to the rest of the world. And so Freud and um, Sigmund Freud and Anna Freud spent a lot of time identifying these ego defenses. And blame isn't specifically one of those ego defenses, but it fits into a lot of them. Scholarship talks about three different kinds of blame. There's extra pu uh, punitive, which is I'm blaming you. And so what's that doing for your ego, for your constructed sense of self, is that you are, <laughs> you are looking at comparing yourself to somebody else and judging them as not doing a good job, and in comparison, that makes you feel better about yourself. There is intrapunitive, which is blaming yourself, and that is also an ego defense. It seems like it's not, throwing yourself up on the sword. How many of you as leaders have at some point said out loud or to yourself, I need to throw myself on the sword for my team. Any of you? Okay, yeah. Well, in sort of the Freudian defense world, that's also about your ego, because then you're making it all about you, right? So that supports your ego as well. And then there's um, impunitive, which you just you know, tend to avoid blame. Um, and all of those things are perfectly normal. I mean, it, but you just have to recognize that when blame arises in your organization, people are trying to preserve themselves. And so how do we get to a point where we aren't so afraid of being wrong that it doesn't drive us into this primal psychological defense of our, our self-preservation. Um, how many of you, raise your hand, if when you were in school, you loved pop quizzes? OK. So of the people who loved pop quizzes, did you, um, I can't see your name tag. Um, you were a person who raised your hand. Tim, so Tim, did you love pop quizzes because you always got them right? No? Why did you love them? It was an opportunity to learn. Okay, good. Anybody care to admit that you loved pop quizzes because you always got them right? <laughs> All right, we have, we have an honest person in the room. Um, and not that you're not honest, Tim. That's not what I meant. Uh, so, yeah, pop quizzes, um, are really actually very effective because your limbic system, which is a part of your brain that you share with other mammals, sort of dogs and cats and things, that's sort of your conditioning, learning part of your brain. And when you take a test and you get the answer wrong, you have pain. <laughs> Uh, you know, that pain-pleasure response. Pain and pleasure is what's used to condition us, to sort of train us. It's, you know, training animals and things. You get that pain, and then you, in a pop quiz, the teacher gives you that answer right away, and then you immediately get the pleasure of getting that right answer. Well, your hippocampus, which is sort of the seat of your deep learning, um, that is in your limbic system, and when you get that pain reward stimulus, then it's much easier for you to remember the lessons from those tests. So pain is, you know, not pleasant, but it's still a part of how we learn, and it's a part of how we make sense of the world, and it's a part of how 
organizations learn. And if we end up in an organization, let's say, where you see a lot of blame, which means a lot of people are trying to preserve their sense of selves, they're trying to survive on their own, then you are dealing with an organization that can't fully address its pain. I abandoned this. <laughs> so let's go back to failure. And this is sort of Todd's definition, but maybe not. Failure is the occurrence of the unexpected, the unintended, or the unwanted. So a big problem with how we interpret, how we feel about being wrong, is that we add blame, we blame ourselves around the occurrence of the unexpected, the unwanted, and the, um, and the unexpected. But <laughs> the problem is that what we've done is we've confused failure with an outcome. So how many times in the, before the Challenger disaster, and I, I, I know that a lot of you know a lot of, thing, a lot of things about these cases, how many times do you think the O-rings failed in the solid um, fuel rockets for the Challenger disaster before there was a disaster that had the loss of life of the crew? Yes. No, pretty much every time. So fail, that failure was a regular occurrence. Failure was a part it became, failure became a normal part of their operation. And there were engineers who were very concerned about it and wanted to do something around it, but they hadn't had the bad consequence yet. And the normalization of that failure, that not being curious about what went wrong, uh, ultimately created a situation where they didn't look into it, and they put them, then they ended up in a situation where everything came together in the right way, the temperature on that day, um, to ultimately end up with a really horrible consequence. How many times <laughs> do you think there was foam loss um, in the Columbia launches before the Columbia tragedy? Almost every time, it was closer to like 80% of the time. They didn't gather data on everything. Um, so um, more than 80% of the uh, recorded, uh, videotaped launches had foam loss. So <laughs> that's the thing. We are failing all the time. And how can we then take advantage of that? Take advantage of that to learn. And, and not, I mean, we talk about learning from failure all the time. And, and I mean, in some ways, you guys should be, well, this is a snoozeville, Martha. We talk about this all the time. But I want us to look at it a little bit differently so that we actually get to the point where we see our wrongness and our mistakes all of the time. And we see how it's a part of our process. It's a part of our normal work and we actually get curious about it. So instead of recoiling from the pain of that being a dumbass, we actually get curious about uh, being a dumbass. So um, <laughs> this is really interesting. Uh, what's his, Professor Dunbar, I can't remember, Niall Dun Neil Dunbar, Niall Dunbar, at the University of Maryland, right over here. He um, is an educational neuroscientist. And he did this study. And he was looking at researchers, scientists. And he found that you know, they would set up their hypothesis, and then they would do their experiment. And when the experiment wasn't what they expected, he would get activity in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is a region, and its function is around working memory, and it's also around selective memory, selective attention. And so basically what he calls the dorsolateral prefrontal uh, cortex is the delete key. 
So when they would get results that they didn't want, and these are scientists who know that they are just trying to, you know, they are supposed to be curious about their experiments not going right. That's where they learn. But they, too, just get rid of information that they don't want. So <laughs> you might think, well, I'm not a scientist. This doesn't really apply to me. But I would submit that every decision you make is an experiment. Anyone care to, to venture why I would say that? Why is every decision you make an experiment? John. You have incomplete information. You have incomplete information is what John says. Yes. You, when you make, I mean, what is a hypothesis? A hypothesis is an informed, as best you can, a well-informed guess, right? So you gather information, you have your observations, you have your experiences, which you gather before you make a decision, and then based on your guess of if this, then that, then you make a decision and you act on it. When you act on that decision, you're basically conducting an experiment, testing that hypothesis to see if your prediction of what would happen if you did that is actually true. And Todd mentioned VUCA on Tuesday, and we can't understate it. Um, the world is volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's ambiguous. And so if you don't have perfect information, and none of you do, then when you get to a point of making a decision, you're experimenting. And what you don't want to do when you experiment, when you act, when you make, you, you learn something from a learning team, you do some, you gather some information from all the work that you're doing, is then to act on it and ignore the feedback that you're getting that shows that you might be wrong. So one of the things that we need to do is get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And you know, I say that a lot, and we hear that a lot, and it's kind of hard to think about, well, how am I going to do it? Well, there are some ways that we do it with respect to being wrong, and one of them is making a failure resume. Anyone here ever done a failure resume? No? So it's um, really kind of fun <laughs> to think about, here are the things that I've tried and I screwed up. Here are the things that I wanted to do, but I didn't actually end up doing. Here are the things that I thought would make me happy, rich, successful, and just plain didn't. I'd like you to share and, well, my computer needs to wake up in order to happen. Oh, here we go. I'm going to turn on this one. I'd like you to share something that you failed at. Awesome. Okay, so lots of failed marriages. I'm right there with you. Lots of failed weight loss. Baking, some big baking disasters. Organic chemistry, yeah, I can see that happen. <laughs> now, as you reflect on these, can you think about, I mean, and not you know, in our sort of classic lessons learned way, but can you think about how the experience of this failure in some way changed you or helped you? Does anyone want to share how just even reflecting on that failure might be helpful? Anyone? Oh, here you go. 
it just dis- seems to stay in your memory longer, whether it really marks it or not. And then, of course, you have a choice then to say, am I going to pick myself up or make a plan or, or something like that? Just just seems to stick a little more. Yeah, yeah. You, you sort of, those lessons are harder learned and, and they, can, they can truly make a difference. Um, all right. We will, hold on, we will move out of this and go here. So anybody seen this TED Talk? Jai Jang's TED Talk. So what he did was he looked at his life and he thought about all the things that he hadn't achieved that he wanted to achieve. And he came up with a hypothesis. Well, my problem is my fear of rejection. So how do I get over my fear of rejection? He found a blog on the internet where all great wisdom comes from. And there was a 30-day challenge to condition yourself to rejection. So here are some of the things that he did. And I really (laughs) encourage you to watch this TED Talk because it's fantastic. He went to his, he, you know, had a burger at his favorite, favorite burger joint. And he went up and he asked for a burger refill. He walked up to a security guard in a burly security guard in a building and asked them for a hundred bucks. He, this one was actually a failure at failure. <laughs> he, he went to a donut place and he said, can you please make the donuts in the shape of the Olympic symbol? So all of these interlocking rings. And <laughs> the baker there was so fascinated by this idea. She like sketched things up right then and there and she totally made donuts in the shape of an o- Olympic rings. But what's interesting about it, what he gets out of it, is that he, one, he did learn to be more accepting and, and uh, of being rejected. And the fear of rejection didn't drive him any longer. Um, but he also realized that his assumptions about being rejected were not true. So the guy who said, no, I'm not going to give you a hundred bucks, before, you know, Jai ran ran away in fear, said, so what do you need it for? And he realized that wasn't what I expected, was for someone to actually be interested and concerned in why I need that hundred dollars. I mean, there was a possibility, actually, that he would have, he would have said yes. And, you know, the guy that he asked for the burger refill for, he actually thought about it for a minute and said, you know, I'll talk to my manager about it and we'll see if maybe we can <laughs> do burger refills. Um, so, <laughs> so, you know, the, the thing is that if we condition ourselves to being wrong, there might be a, a lot of things that might open up for us. So this is, and, and you know, and now that I share any psychological study, I'm thinking about that first thing about 50% of them are not, um, are not reproducible. So, um, so this study of 137 hospitals, this was done in 2019, they, there's a standard um, score for openness, and openness is basically our willingness to um, embrace new ideas, right? Um, to our willingness to engage with the unknown. Um, and so when they did this study of 137 hospitals, they found that if you increased the aggregate openness score in the staff and in the physicians, by one point, they saw a 6.5% reduction in mortality rates. If they reduced their um, error rates, they saw a 1.6% reduction in mortality rates. If they reduced their error, um, what's the term that they use? Um, their error reporting, they reduced their mortality rates by 1.25%. Uh, so this openness, this being openness to the unexpected, the new, being a dumbass, um, that is really helpful 
in our being able to adapt and manage our VUCA environments that we're working in, and really there's no much more of a VUCA environment than a hospital where people are continually needing to improvise. My father was a neurosurgeon, and he used to say that disease is different in everybody. You can't really say that you understand a disease until you see its very unique manifestation in every individual's body. So, actually, before we go here, I want to, I, uh, <laughs> I want to ask you a question about, I want to go back here. I want to go b back to Jai. If you were to do an experiment where you were trying to condition yourself against being wrong, what are some of the things that you would try? Where would you try and be wrong? Anybody have some ideas? <laughs> all right, trying to get a ride home, that's a good idea. <laughs> a ride all the way back to Texas, yeah. All right, anybody else? Some ideas about what you might do to, you know, put yourself in a position to be wrong? Tell off. Tell operations you had a good idea. Excellent, good. <laughs> I have said a lot of times that I am a huge fan of bad art and bad music because it is people trying to do something that they very well might not be good at at all, have no talent for at all, but they're completely willing to engage in it. I love karaoke, not because it's gentle on my ears, but I love karaoke because of that willingness that people have to stand in front of others and just give it a go and probably, uh, in the audience's perspective, fail miserably. So this brings us to in improv. <laughs> the way that we have approached safety for a very long time is no, don't. I, you know, I think of what Andy talked about yesterday and all of the ways that at first she tried to create this no-don't environment, and we've all done that. Try and think about how you can switch from no-don't to yes-and. So, yes, <laughs> I recognize that you want to go through this highly pressurized room, and what needs to happen in order for that to be done safely, in order for that to work, for you to achieve the aims that you have, in order, that, you know, the reason why you want to go through that pressurized room. Um, any examples that you can think of of a switch from no, don't to yes, and? How could you turn that around? So uh, I took a job as a, a running research safety at a big R1 university. It was a big risk, and I didn't last very long. <laughs> okay. So I'm used to being wrong. Um, but I really had to tune the way I looked at safety to where it really was an and yes, because they had to get this research done. They had these huge grants, and these were important questions to, ask for, to answer for society, right? So they want to do really weird, risky stuff, but I couldn't say no. So I had to say, okay, you want to uh, make a cat radioactive and then put it out with other cats. And I mean, they would do the weirdest stuff, and I'd say, okay, let's figure out how we can do that without anyone getting hurt. And I think that changed my whole mindset about how safety should be done. You, had, you need to work with the worker to let them accomplish their goals um, in the best way that you can. I'm, I'm very concerned about radioactive cats. <laughs> I, another, uh, I, another way to try and achieve this is to seek out bad news and scan for change. And this is different. Some, a lot of people were joking about open door policy yesterday. This is very different about 
ha than having an open door policy. And somebody, <laughs> and I really thought he was joking, uh, one time threw out this idea of seeking bad news is, you know, you know, in a pre-job brief or something, saying, okay, what are we not talking about? And I, I'm pretty sure that was a line in some, uh, you know, a, that a therapist gave in, um, in The Sopranos or something like that. But, um, but what are we not talking about? How can we go out and, and think about things that we are avoiding thinking about? Because it's not necessarily that people are hiding bad information from you. It's that their delete button <laughs> has been activated in their brain because it's not something that they want to know. It's painful. And, um, and the organization, their environment, their own emotional ability to manage it has basically said, this bad news is not for prime time. So creating that opportunity to actually seek it out, make it, you know, make it perfectly safe and normal to talk about it. And the other thing is to scan for change. Um, actually looking around, well, what is different today? Where have things changed? How are things volatile? Where has the uncertainty increased? What are we dealing, how do we find ambiguous situations? And, and think about how do we build that into the work that you're already doing with pre-job briefs, with after action reviews, with learning teams, with all of the ways that you're gathering data, um, how do we create an environment where it's okay to talk about this stuff? The other thing is challenging assumptions and constructing competing models. And this is a very standard critical, critical thinking tools, right? So um, whenever you are throwing out a new pro uh, proposal, identifying what those assumptions are. A lot of times, assumptions are completely hidden to us. So if we can have a devil's advocate, or we have somebody whose job it is to actually root out those assumptions, challenge them, or before we put out a proposal on how we can change things, a great idea, and this is something you can do in your learning teams, is have somebody come up with a competing idea and actually have them debate it. I mean, that kind of, um, that creates a lot of social anxiety for people, yeah. And you know what, that's okay. Um, because the, the, uh, the, the experience that they have in hashing out their ideas um, allows them to be open to other changes in the future. So, <laughs> I just like this picture. That's really why I put it up here. Um, <laughs> you know, the truth is that curiosity um, is a risk, right? So Amy Edmondson, when she talks about psychological safety, says that we all are dealing with interpersonal risk. What you should assume when you pull any group of people together, that we're always entering into it with fear, right? Fear that we're going to be judged, fear that we're going to be wrong, fear that we're going to be a dumbass, fear that... Um, that we're going to be rejected and we're not going to belong. That's always lingering there. And curiosity is a risk to all of those things, right? Curiosity is what asks you for a burger, uh, sets you up to ask for a burger refill. Um, but being able to cultivate that curiosity in your organization through all of these things and other things that you might do is, is what is going to help you find those ongoing solutions so that you can adapt to, to a changing environment. So I have, we have five minutes for any questions that you might have. Tanya. So Martha, I love this. I think you're absolutely right. I love the idea of embrace the red and challenge the green and all this kind of thing. Although in the back of my mind, I can hear Dr. Hallnagel saying, look, look at how our obsession with failure has brought us. And I can, I can still remember one of the early presentations he showed on having just reams and reams and reams of negative metrics. And he says, 
why don't we look at what we're doing well? And I'd just like you to try to marry these concepts together. So what I'm talking about, I think, is more around the emotional side of it, right? Is that we need to condition ourselves to this. And this is um, what Charles was talking about before, that in a way, as safety leaders, we need to change ourselves in order to prepare our organizations for that organizational change. And so if, <clears throat> and you know, where this ultimately goes, and this is a whole other talk, is switching from ego-based survival in the organization to survival as the whole. You know, where our survival depends on the well-being of everybody, but that ego-based survival out of fear is what keeps us there. And if we as leaders can become comfortable with, with talking about how we're wrong, um, talking about our failures, then we're able to see more of the information that we're dealing with. I totally agree from an operational standpoint around this idea of looking at normal work and looking, what is, looking at what is working. But to know what is working, you need to know what hazards those barriers stopped, right? And so you need to have a full view of all of it, not just, not just focusing on the failure, absolutely, but not just focusing on we were right, right? This uh, obsession, um, cultural, a cultural need to be right, I think can create some problems. I think you get the last word, Dave. Um, Thanks. No, you, we can have more, more questions. We have. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Um, to follow up with Tanya, what Tanya said, and also to follow on here, and I can't remember the exact wording of the slide earlier, but you said basically failure, just being wrong doesn't necessarily mean that we fail. Being right doesn't necessarily mean that we succeed. Yeah. Is that like the reflexive of that? And then if you look at what, I don't know what Holnagel said exactly, but I trust Tanya. <laughs> right? Like we should look at why we succeed. It's like, yeah, we, I agree, you know, but with the exact same level of curiosity, it ought to be, you know, why, it ought to be almost as much, you know, curiosity and, and, um, and I guess, uh, inward looking uh, uh, about our successes as we are about our failures, but often we just let the successes flow into the past. So. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it falls into this whole, you mean, what I was trying to give you is kind of a psychological foundation of a lot of these things that you hear. Like, don't be a solution, be a problem solver, not a solution finder. Well, there is a psychological component to getting to a point to being a problem solver. To be a problem solver, you need to um, emotionally be in a place where you and your organization is willing to spend a little time with some real problems and it feel okay and it not feel like a problem conversation in your organization is a career limiting conversation to bring together. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, that fear is justified, but even the people who are making the decisions to limit someone else's career, they're making that decision out of fear as well. Sort of that unwillingness to tolerate what they see as wrong in their organization because they see wrong as exclusive to being right. Anybody else? just going to ask about the whole get comfortable with being uncomfortable mm -hmm. and I was curious what thoughts you had in terms of suggestions for organizations to try and help improve that comfort level with being uncomfortable. <laughs> sounds easy, but it's not. No, it sounds easy, but it is not at all. Um, I think that, I mean, I, I, kind of, I kind of am with Todd about asking better questions, right? And so we're asking questions that slowly lead us to talk about things that we hadn't talked about before, and we create a safe space for that. We um, create environments where we can challenge each other more, and then we become, um, we become more comfortable with that. Um, 
it's, uh, it's around, you know, it's around these, you know, four big components of psychological safety, which is not just diversity, but true inclusion, where people can show up as their, you know, complex selves and tell you stuff about themselves that they had previously thought was not, that was essentially in the strict term of the word, obscene in their organization, where it's okay for, to ask for help, so asking for help doesn't mean you're, doesn't label you as a dumbass, and offering help doesn't make you a mansplainer, and, um, you know, and th this whole idea of just being able to say to somebody, I disagree with you. I disagree with that. And that not being, um, fi you know, true fighting words or that not being shutting someone down and embarrassing them. Now, there's going to be that element of embarrassment, but emotionally we have to get used to that. Just, oh, I'm a, I'm a, little, <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed right now. But yeah, here, here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going through this. We got another question. Yeah, I love you. Hey, uh, yeah, man, so let, me, let me mansplain this to you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay. Um, we got to be cautious when we're talking about failures. Because, for instance, in the shuttle, uh, the, the first one, you could say, yeah, yeah, the, the O-rings failed a lot of times. No, 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 no. What was a mission objective? The mission objective was to get the rocket from here to there without consequence. So, no, there was only one failure of consequence. And we got to be cautious. The same thing, getting that shuttle back down. There was only one failure, you know. There was so, one bad consequence. One yeah. bad consequence. A failure with consequence. Right. But there but was failure there were multiple that was part of that all Without along consequence. Way. So, I, you know, just it's just important that we understand that when we're talking failure, you're talking little failures that have no consequence or big failures that where the mission objective is not accomplished. But I guess, I mean, I, I get that, but I mean, what I'm trying to move us for, I'm trying to move us into the process to learning before we kill people, um, to learn before the consequence is untenable, um, to sort of look at the messiness. When we look at normal work, it's successful because it reaches that outcome, but that does not mean that it's not messy. And it does not mean that there were unexpected things happening the whole time they were doing that work. And understanding that all of that unexpected, unintendedness helps us understand what the real risk and hazard profile is in that normal work. So, you know, outcomes are impossible to ignore, but I'm talking about the stuff that we ignore all the time. And I'm done. No, no. no. Oh, one more, no, one more Martha. One more oh, for you. Okay. Oh, always has to be one more from me. Oh, of course. Yeah. Hey, look, um, wonderful as always. And one thing that really changed me was this Japanese saying, which was basically, you fear the green and embrace the red. Mm -hmm. And it really is a philosophy, which is to go outside that comfort go into that area and be curious and you can learn. So thank you very much, you, yeah. you're, you're great. And I mean, I, I like that and I don't really even think we need to fear the green. I mean, because there's the, you know, in that, that limbic learning model, there is a relationship between pleasure and pain. It's not like we just learn from pain and it's not like we just learn from pleasure. You need both of them together to reinforce that deep learning. Um, so, you know, have the pleasure too, but don't, don't create this unquestioned belief that the pain makes the pleasure not worth it. And to play off one of the Brents there, a, another Japanese saying is, no problem is the biggest problem of all. Either you don't understand the blue line or people don't feel comfortable in bringing you the blue line, right? So we want to embrace the ugly side of business. We're going to have an extended break. If you have questions that you just didn't want to ask in front of everybody, please now give Martha the hand that she deserves.